Now, a discussion about Osama bin Laden and the political and cultural dynamics of Central Asia. The Carnegie Endowment for International Peace hosted this event today in Washington, D.C., taking part a Georgetown University government professor and a former reporter for the Times of London who's reported on Afghanistan and Pakistan. It's about an hour and a half. Good afternoon. Welcome to the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. I'm Thomas Carruthers, Vice President for Studies at the Endowment, moderator of today's session. As America recovers from the physical and emotional damage and shock of last week's horrendous attack, intense attention is now focusing on what the U.S. response should be. A wide-ranging debate is already taking shape in our country over what should be the goals of a U.S. response and the means. Over the next several weeks at the endowment and next several months, we will be holding a series of meetings to try to shed light on critical aspects of these policy issues. The purpose of today's session is to contribute to a greater understanding of some of, some of the complexities of what is ahead for the United States, complexities that are born out of the region of the world to which primary attention is now being given. Yet even just determining what that region is, what is Osama bin Laden's neighborhood, is not straightforward. Last Friday, the lead New York Times editorial was entitled Rendezvous with Afghanistan, and it stated, I quote, unless the evidence trail takes an unexpected turn, it will lead American diplomacy and quite possibly American combat forces into one of the world's most volatile and tangled regions. At its epicenter lies Afghanistan, an impoverished and backward nation that over the centuries has been a battleground and graveyard for the interests of great powers. Yet though Afghanistan has served as the territorial base for some of Osama bin Laden's operations, this is a movement whose neighborhood is much wider. Bin Laden himself is from Saudi Arabia. His associates come from many parts of the Islamic world, including Egypt, Iraq, the Gulf states, Pakistan, and many other countries. The ideas he espouses and the issues that motivate him have something to do with Afghanistan and its immediate surroundings, but they have equally much to do with other issues. The struggle of fundamentalist groups within many Arab societies, the U.S. role in the Middle East, the Arab-Israeli conflict, the war against Iraq, and many other issues. In short, a better title for that, op for that editorial might have been Rendezvous with Islamic Fundamentalism, which means that the United States is confronting a deep, complex chain of events and movements, decades old, cutting across large areas of several continents. To help provide a deeper understanding of the issues before our country, we're calling today on three scholars who have significant expertise on, larger, on parts of this larger neighborhood. In order of appearance, Martha Olcott, a senior associate at the endowment, is a longtime specialist on Central Asia and Islam. Anatole Levin, also a senior associate at the endowment, has wide-ranging experiences of relevance, including time in Afghanistan in the 1980s, traveling as a journalist with both the rebels and government forces, in Chechnya in the 1990s, and in India and Pakistan across the years. And last, Daniel Brumberg is an associate professor of government at Georgetown University, an expert on Arab politics, as well as politics in Iran. Each of our panelists will speak, and then we'll take your questions and have discussion. Martha? Thank you. Um, I'll try to keep my remarks brief, so we'll have a lot of time to talk about some of the issues that I'll be raising. <clears throat> last week was an unprecedented time in American history. And the bombings in New York and Washington with the horrific loss of life are serving as a wake-up call that Americans are unable to isolate themselves what go, from what goes on in, these, in very distant lands. There is a natural desire to want to strike back and to punish the people responsible for these terrible deeds. But as we consider what actions to take, we must be cognizant of the complexity of the challenges that we face in trying to destroy the terrorist groups who planned and executed these crimes. In setting out to punish these groups, U.S. policymakers should be concerned to try and minimize the problems that are created as a result of our action. In framing our response, I would hope that U.S. policymakers would consider the following six things, which are what I will talk to you about today. Um, the first is that 
challenges to U.S. security will not disappear with the capture or assassination of Osama bin Laden and may even be exacerbated by it. Um, for all these reasons, it seems imperative to separate the problem of making what we need to do to make Americans feel safe at home from the problem of punishing the perpetrators of these actions. For if, if we rely on punishing the perpetrators of these actions as the source of our feeling safe at home, I fear that we will not feel safe at home for a long time. I'm not going to talk today, obviously, about what we need to make America a safer place. That's really a topic for other meetings, for other types of specialists. But I think, as a regional specialist, that we're making a terrible mistake if we think that we can do some action in Afghanistan or that part of the world and have an instant reduction or even a slow reduction of tensions here at home, of the problems here at home. They must be approached as separate challenges. And the rest of my talk, obviously, I will talk about the challenge of engaging in that part of the world. Um, in preparing my remarks, I'm assuming that we are going to decide that we have to respond to Osama bin Laden. I'm not assuming, I'm not presuming his guilt. I'm simply assuming that he was capable of these kinds of actions and that his people represent a threat to us that we feel now must be dealt with. Okay. The second point that I want to make is <laughs> We've heard a great deal about American might in the past several days. In framing our response, we must be cognizant of the fact that while American might is awesome, American might is unable to change geography. Um, the simple truth is that Afghanistan is one of the most remote and most inhospitable places in the world uh, to try and engage in military action. Osama bin Laden has hidden out in one of the most remote, remote parts in the world, and he's done it on purpose, not just because of the political environment in Afghanistan, but because of the difficulty of actually engaging an enemy in Afghanistan. Guerrillas operating in mountainous countries always have enormous advantages over foreign troops that seek to defeat them. Um, and you add to this the landlocked nature of <laughs> Afghanistan which will make engaging in any sort of sustained military action very, very difficult. Um, I'll talk in a minute about the problem of partners with whom we can engage. Um, but I do think as we think about engaging militarily in Afghanistan, we not forget the many, 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 many lessons of the so recent Soviet failure in Afghanistan. Um, there are lots of causes for why the Soviet Union did not succeed in conquering Afghanistan. Um, many of them ideological, the kind of partners they took and what they were trying to sell in Afghanistan. But there was also a significant military failure, a military defeat that they suffered there. And that had a whole host of causes. Um, but they suffered this military defeat at a very time that they were able to maintain continuous lines of supply because they were invading a neighboring country. We will not have that kind of advantage if we go in. Um, we will have a much more complicated uh, supply problem that they had. Um, three, I'd like to talk a little about the problem of staging an attack um, and the dangers that we run if we stage an attack in isolation of a full-fledged re recovery program for Afghanistan. Many of us have spent enormous amounts of time over the past several years talking about the need to have a complete recovery program for Afghanistan. I mean, that you cannot engage in Afghanistan if you're not willing to take on the burden of reconstructing that society. Um, many of us have been warning in our writings that, it, that Afghanistan was kind of a time bomb for the whole South, for the whole South Asia region, uh, that the absence of a of a government that was both internationally recognized and capable of governing the, capable of administering the territory, and let alone tackling the country's problems, were one that were causing a whole host of security risks. And I'm obviously not going to touch on them today. Um, but security risks of which one was Islamic terrorism, another was an enormous drug problem. Okay. There the third point really has to do with this. There can be no neat 
tactical strikes in Afghanistan. The whole question of how we will stage our attacks is really critical. If we take out bin Laden but leave the Taliban government in place, we further destabilize the situation in Afghanistan and in Pakistan. Um, if we try and remove the Taliban government, that creates, I would argue, a moral as well as a political imperative to deal with the void that is left. We can't simply, I really think it would, it is unacceptable to create a void that we're not willing to, to try and close. That means working closely with the Afghan people and the various factions that remain in the death of um, Shah Massoud this week really changes the ability to have any sort of transition. It, it makes what was complicated even more complicated. Um, but there would have to be some form of international effort to create a coalition government in Afghanistan and to help provide the economic assistance necessary to, to do to have some sort of recovery program for Afghanistan. I would argue that this recovery program for Afghanistan has to be part of a broader based regional recovery program. The government and political situation in Pakistan is certain to be destabilized by any actions we take in, in Afghanistan. It will be one form of destabilization if they are, support our actions and are an active participant in it. It will be easy for us to come in and help bolster them up, but we will be obliged to help bolster them up. And if they refuse to participate um, and the Taliban remain in place, then there is a further security risk emanating from Pakistan that will um, have an impact on the neighboring countries. <laughs> So there's no separating the situation from in Pakistan from the situation in Afghanistan. Okay. Four, I'd like to say a few words about Uzbekistan. That is another potential staging area for any sort of action in Afghanistan. Um, and the situation in the calculus of decision making for Uzbekistan is going to be complex. Uh, the, administration in, in Moscow, the Russian government, seems to be against the idea of the U.S. using any of the former Soviet states to launch either unilateral or a NATO response, um, it, to launch a response that doesn't include Russia. This is likely to affect any decisions made by Tajikistan to participate in a U.S. to support a U.S. action because Tajikistan is part of a collective security agreement with Russia. Uzbekistan is not part of this security agreement with Russia. Uzbekistan has a close military relationship with Russia, um, but they are very clearly an independent actor internationally, able to make a decision that Russia disapproves of. <clears throat> but if they if we engage with Uzbekistan and get the, and they agree to grant us landing rights there um, with Russia's disapproval, then we must be sensitive to the fact that we will be assuming Uzbekistan's security burden. You know, there is no way that Russia will be willing to help Uzbekistan with its security burden if Uzbekistan provides landing rights or otherwise engages with a U.S. force. Uh, against Russia's wishes. Um, so by doing that, we either will be assuming Uzbekistan's burden or worse yet, leaving Uzbekistan to face security risks alone that have been exacerbated by a situation of supporting US, um, a US action. Finally, I would argue strongly that if we are to engage with Uzbekistan, we must engage with them in a systematic way and not just on a security agenda. Uzbekistan has its own Islamic opposition and it has serious social, economic, and social and economic problems. The regime in power in Uzbekistan has taken very harsh actions against Islamic opposition, including against peaceful opposition. This has to be something that the U.S. would continue to find troubling it should be something that the U.S. should continue to find troubling as we engage with Uzbekistan on security questions. This, I would argue, gives the U.S. 
an obligation to help the Uzbeks defeat the agenda of their own Islamic groups and not just the person of these people. I'm talking about peaceful groups. What this means is that if we use Uzbekistan as any sort of launching point um, or transit point in actions in Afghanistan, we have to be committed to provide the Uzbeks with a kind of economic and political assistance they need to make a difference at home so that the regime is less obsessed with this Islamic with peaceful Islamic opposition and is able to disarm its critics through creating economic opportunities for the population. Um, this takes me to my next point, which is a few thoughts on Islamic terrorism. And unfortunately, I'm running out of time, so there will just be a few thoughts. Um, the global Islamic movement is like a hydra. To cut off one head only means that others will grow. Um, bin Laden's organization has, had, has ties with a host of other Islamic groups, as well as cells in dozens of nations. We've been hearing about this and reading about this in the press all week. Um, however, I think we have to remain sensitive to the fact that the issues which allow these groups to mobilize supporters are complex. And if we want to deal with these groups, to defeat these groups, we have to do more than eliminate their leaders and the graduates of their terror camps. We have to deal with the root causes of the popularity of these groups and why people sign up to support them and why people provide them safe haven. It's not just a question of the supporters. It's a question of the people that, that would never think of turning in some of the Islamic terrorists because they support enough of their agenda. Um, in order to do this, I think, we will need to think through our the U.S. will need to think through, and, and all our allies will need to think through, our policies in a number of areas. These include two. One, what kinds of foreign assistance we give and how much foreign assistance we give to some of these countries. And two, what is a legitimate use of domestic force? Um, because I think it, it is really... It's really critical that we don't abandon our commitment um, to human rights and to freedom of religion, even for groups whose programs may be ones that make us very, very uncomfortable, as long as they're peaceful groups. Finally, my sixth point. For all the reasons that I have stated in my brief talk, I feel really strongly that the that the best and potential that the best response for the U.S. is a is a truly multilateral one. Um, I would argue that the only kind of response that is likely to lead to a sustained change in the security environment in this part of the world is a multilateral one. Some sort of multi not simply a multilateral force against terrorism, uh, not simply a multilateral campaign against terrorism, but a multilateral military action if, in which all the region states are given reason to support U.S. or U.S. and NATO actions, in which all the region's states are able to see that their national interests are furthered by, these, by the actions that we take. Um, and the only way that we can construct such a multilateral force is if we're willing to to participate in policies of pooling our resources to help the various states in the region cope with their security, their economic, and their social problems. In conclusion, some of you listening to me may feel that a lot of what I'm arguing sounds naive, you know, that there's no way that we're going to devote these kind of resources, we're not going to have multilateral recovery programs, and we'll take a unilateral action if we can't get a working multilateral coalition. But I, was, but I would argue, as someone who has been traveling this region for over 25 years, that the naivety is not in the approach I propose. The naivety would be in expecting that there can be any simple fixes to the complex problems that this region faces. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Martha. We'll hear next from Anatole Levin. Thank you very much indeed. As a a British subject in America, there are certain, and a European, of course, 
there are sometimes certain ambiguities when you use the word we. I hope on this occasion, on this subject, that we can talk about we. I believe that Britain certainly will be very much at one with America uh, over this. Um, something that Britain can provide, of course, especially when it comes to Afghanistan, is not just, I hope, some very good troops, but also some very good advice based on some very bitter past experiences, um, which now go back um, more than 150 years. Uh, I'd like to endorse very strongly everything that, that Martha has said and perhaps expand on, on one or two points. First of all, of course, the point that this is going to be a very long and complex struggle. Indeed, it already has been a long struggle. What we saw last week was, of course, by far the most terrible terrorist attack, not just in American history, but anywhere in the world. But it wasn't, of course, the first. Uh, we have now been under threat from various kinds of terrorism uh, based in different parts of the Muslim world for almost 30 years. I fear uh, that we are going to be at threat and we are going to be involved in a struggle for decades to come. In other words, this is certainly not an area where one should encourage anybody uh, to think of quick solutions, quick victories, and above all, final victories. There is, I think, a useful analogy here, uh, both in terms of good lessons and very strong warnings with the Cold War. Because, of course, the, the, the military side of the Cold War uh, against various forms of communist threat uh, was in many ways the least important aspect of that struggle. It can even be argued that, at least on certain occasions, including one very big one, Vietnam, uh, the military aspect was in fact unnecessary and disastrous. Much more important over time uh, in most of the world was the whole complex, not just on occasions of military measures and security measures, but of ideological struggle, of social struggle, of social uh, and economic measures, and as Martha has said, of various kinds of aid to states which we viewed as endangered uh, by communism. The other point, of course, to make in terms of a warning, uh, well, two things. One is that in most parts of the world, the extent to which we ourselves could carry on these broader and more complex campaigns was very limited. In some places, indeed, where we tried to do that ourselves, it actually produced very counterproductive results. In the end, we were dependent on local states themselves to carry out these struggles, and we had to strengthen them. The second warning uh, from the Cold War, of course, is that it is very, very important to distinguish between different states and different traditions uh, among those who at first sight, we might regard as part of a kind of common enemy camp. Uh, now, I'm, I mustn't, of course, preempt what Daniel is going to say about uh, Iran. And it may well be that the moment is, is not, or at least not yet, ripe for any kind of attempt at a grand reconciliation with Iran, you know, something along the lines of uh, Nixon and Kissinger's reconciliation with China uh, in, in, the 19, in the early 1970s. Nonetheless, one thing of which we must be absolutely aware and we must study is, of course, the very deep differences within the Muslim world, of which in this context of Osama bin Laden's neighborhood, the single most important is the Shia Sunni split and the split between Iran and on one side, and the Taliban and Taliban-backed Sunni extremism on the other, uh, because it's all too often forgotten uh, that over the years, not just hundreds but thousands of Shias in Pakistan have fallen victim to terror attacks which are carried out by groups backed by the Taliban. Um, this has created, or helped to create, along of course with incidents inside Afghanistan, the most tremendous hostility uh, of Iran to the Taliban and even to some extent to Sunni extremism in general. Uh, 
a hostility which is felt first and foremost not by the people who we re would regard as natural allies, the liberals in, or the relative liberals in Iran, though these, they feel this as well, but often precisely by the most hardline Shia elements. But anyway, as I say, Daniel, I'm sure we'll talk more about this. But just to make this point about the, the Cold War, it was the failure to recognize, despite the fact that the signs were already all too, too, too evident, the growing split between the Soviet Union and China in the early 1960s, which helped lead America into the whole Vietnam debacle, which, if that split had been recognized, would, I think, uh, have been seen as, uh, as unnecessary. As I say, even if we are not going to you know, attempt some grand reconciliation with Iran, it's very important, at least, that Iran should not be made the target, I mean, not of military attack, I'm sure nobody is thinking about that, but of some kind of wider reprisals uh, against um, what we would regard as Islamic radicalism. Uh, at the moment, I mean, uh, well, n not at the moment, but up to last Tuesday, um, American policy in the region was not dual containment, as has often been said. It was more like quadruple containment. <laughs> Iraq, Iran, increasingly the Taliban, and, of course, there were also strong uh, tendencies to try to push back Russian influence in Central Asia. Well, clearly, now, something has to change, and I'm sure something will change, but we need to think very carefully and concretely about how to change it. I mean, Martha has touched on a number of other very important points with where we could draw lessons from the Cold War. One of which, of course, is not committing ourselves unconditionally to regimes which may not be, not only be very unsavory, but which may also be very endangered without trying to do things to actually change and strengthen those societies internally. That is an immensely complex process. But without it, uh, we could um, risk real disasters in future. Because, as I've pointed out, or tried to, um, the most important issue now is not struggles between states, even in the case of Afghanistan, although there the struggle against the Taliban is, of course, the first um, thing to concentrate on. But most importantly, in the long run, will be the question of struggles within states. Um, Pakistan, after Afghanistan, is the most serious issue now. Because we have to keep in mind that if whatever action America now takes in Afghanistan were to contribute to the collapse of the existing regime and state in Pakistan with Taliban-backed Islamist groups to pick up the pieces, the consequences of that could be almost too terrible to con contemplate in a, in a country which now has nuclear weapons. Pakistan, I think, also gives important lessons in why, whatever you want to call it, and there are different phrases one can use, political, Islamic political radicalism, Quranic radicalism, uh, has grown in parts of the world. You could see it as a kind of default mode, because the unhappy truth is that over the decades, Pakistan has tried a wide range of different political systems and regimes, and they've all of them failed when it comes to carrying out really serious and successful socio-economic development. Uh, there have been several attempts at parliamentary democracy, um, headed by a wide range of different democratically elected regimes, from Bhutto's left-wing nationalism through a semi, a sort of revival of that under his daughter, through to the relatively moderate Islamic uh, government of Nawaz Sharif. We've had several different kinds of military rule, from the old style, rather traditional authoritarian military rule of the 1950s and 60s, through Zia's a uh, more Islamic variant in the 1980s. Now, Musharraf's regime, which seems to be above all a last frantic attempt to keep the country together, but they've none of them really worked. 
In, however, in the process of not working, what very unwisely, of course, successive Pakistani regimes have done is to create not one but two Frankenstein monsters for themselves. Uh, one is, of course, the Taliban, uh, which Pakistan contributed very greatly to getting into power, although it would be quite wrong simply to see the Taliban as, as Pakistani puppets. That's certainly not true. Nonetheless, Pakistan did contribute to their victory. But now, of course, they're suffering a tremendous, or, I mean, the moderate uh, regime of President Musharraf is under tremendous internal threat from radical Islamist forces backed by the Taliban. Uh, most dangerously of all, of course, within the Pakistani army itself, because in all previous Pakistani crises, what it must be bluntly admitted all democratic sympathies notwithstanding, what has held that country together has been the army and the unity of the army. And it's the unity and discipline of the Pakistani army which has prevented Pakistan from becoming more like parts of Africa, say. Now this is threatened uh, by these radical forces within the military, uh, who once again have seen every other variant of attempted uh, rule fail. The second Frankenstein's monster, of course, is Kashmir. Uh, and the radical forces which were originally radical Kashmiri nationalist forces more or less but have become progressively more Islamized uh, or radicalized in the, in the Islamic sense and which are also backed by Taliban. Even more difficult for Pakistan to deal with because of course the struggle with India uh, in Kashmir is part of the original founding purpose of the Pakistani state and army. Uh, Deal resisting these forces is going to take a very serious and very complicated effort on our part. And like Martha, I would certainly emphasize this is not going to be at all easy. And it's going to, of course, involve the recognition uh, that any aid we give to Pakistan, bits of it, are certainly going to run the risk of falling into the hands of our enemies. Nonetheless, as I've said, the consequences simply of putting pressure on Pakistan, uh, particularly the kind of very radical pressure we could be seeing, you know, in the weeks and months to come, without attempting to strengthen the Pakistani state, the consequences of that could be disastrous. <laughs> Secondly, after what has happened, there will undoubtedly be a move to greater sympathy between America and India, which is obviously a relatively secular democracy of a rather particular kind, shall we say, but still in that part of the world, and is also facing some of the same threats as ourselves. Nonetheless, I think it would also be a very serious error to think that one can somehow control Pakistan or influence Pakistan through India. Quite the reverse is going to be the case. You know, too, pushing too far in that direction would be the one thing which would cripple the prestige and potentially destroy the, uh, a government in Islamabad. Um, I would also say that insofar as the tilt towards India has taken place because of uh, a desire to balance China in Asia, we should also recognize that, balance, that after what happened last Tuesday, this kind of big geopolitics balancing China, rolling back Russia, must be seen of very much secondary importance when it comes to truly vital American and uh, Western interests. On Afghanistan, Martha has touched on this. I, I won't say much more. I could do so in answer to questions, if, if you like. Uh, but just once again to endorse very strongly what Martha said about not simply creating another void in Afghanistan. Because after all, one must admit that America has contributed to doing that once already uh, by the way, in, at least, in which it allowed its aid to the Mujahideen in the late 80s to be directed, uh, by, at least to be directed by the Pakistanis, and the way in which that aid carried on after I would say it was at all necessary to, to do so. In Afghanistan, uh, radical Islam, the Taliban as a default mode, is even more uh, evident. Afghanistan, too, over the years, has experienced a wide range of different regimes, an even wider and more radical range uh, than in Pakistan, and they all broke down finally in, in the most ghastly circumstances, leaving Afghanistan now uh, with a regime which is much less like a state than, than a kind of 
I mean, if you were to look for a Christian analogy, some kind of medieval crusading order. From this point of view, some of the talk one now hears, I hope, very much on the fringes about bombing Afghanistan back into a parking lot is profoundly misguided. <laughs> Alas, the Soviets and the Afghans themselves over the past 20 years have done an excellent job of that. You know, this is not a country like Yugoslavia, which one can intimidate by bombing fixed targets. There are no fixed targets. Um, Afghan Taliban ministries contain a few chairs uh, and tables, um, actually not chairs because the tradition is of course to sit on mattresses on the ground. Uh, communication is by mobile phone and walkie-talkie or by notes. You know. uh, it, this, this is not a country where air power, as the Soviets already learned, um, can, um, can do the trick, but as is also obvious, going there on the ground will be very difficult. And, as Martha said, even more difficult as a result of something which, in my view, is unlikely to have been a coincidence, which was the assassination by a suicide bomber of Ahmed Shah Massoud the day before the attacks on America. Um, so to conclude with what I began with, you know, we, we do have to, to settle down for a very long and very complex struggle uh, in which some of our allies, as during the Cold War, will be not at all the ones we presently think of uh, and expect. But victory in war could be defined as reducing the number of your enemies, um, which you can do by killing them or you can do by capturing them. You can do by making them run away or you can do by influencing so that, that they don't join up with your enemies in the first place. But any kind of short-term victory in Afghanistan, even assuming that that can be gained, which actually increases the number of our terrorist enemies or their supporters, above all and most immediately on pa in Pakistan, h however satisfying it might seem in the short term, would actually be a very serious defeat. Thank you. Thank you, Anatole. Finally, we'll hear from Daniel Brumberg. Thanks very much, Tom. I'm going to uh, make my remarks quite brief, um, and I'm going to make some initial remarks about uh, the situation as it pertains uh, to the Arab world, uh, and then I'm going to focus my remarks uh, in some more detail on the question of Iran. Uh, echoing what Anatole and Martha said in some respects and diverging in some other respects as well. Uh, I think it's we're here in part because the level of rhetoric that we've been hearing in the last few days, if you turn on the news, if you turn on uh, this constant coverage of the, uh, the terrible events of the last week or so, uh, has demonstrated that we are in many respects unprepared, uh, both militarily and rhetorically, to address this terrible challenge we face. We have heard about the need to end states. And more particularly, we heard the other day from our president about the uh, need for some sort of crusade. I got a call from an Islamist colleague of mine in London this morning who worried very much about uh, the use of that kind of language as echoing the kind of civilizational view of the West versus Islam or Islam versus the West that is in fact uh, championed by uh, bin Laden and his colleagues uh, in uh, Afghanistan, the Middle East and around the world. Uh, in all the flag waving and efforts to promote a kind of patriotic response, which is understandable in many respects, of course, and might, one might argue necessary, there is always the probability or the possibility of beginning to uh, uh, engage in the kind of rhetoric that will only in some sort of implicit uh, way uh, echo the very kinds of uh, uh, ideas we are trying to, uh, trying to defeat. So I think this is a, an issue that needs to be kept in mind, and uh, one hopes that... Uh, that our leaders, when we uh, begin this, uh, this, this arduous and long task of addressing uh, international terrorism from groups uh, such as bin Laden's in a more effective way than has been, been done thus far, we keep that in mind. Uh, in, in some respects, uh, part of the problem has been the nature of the debate. Uh, we have a kind of polarized uh, uh, a set of explanations about what we're facing. It's very predictable particularly in the academic world, but unfortunately it doesn't help very much in terms of uh, political analysis. On the one hand, we have the argument that uh, the present situation 
uh, is the result of the failure of the United States and the West to address a whole a series of problems, systemic, economic, political, and so on, not least of which is the Palestinian-Israeli conflict, and that the argument goes that only by addressing this, these sorts of issues can we really dry up uh, the well that has supported uh, bin Laden. And on the other hand, we have had the argument that uh, uh, bin Laden is intrinsically evil, that uh, this sort of Islamic extremism is self-generating, uh, and, uh, and therefore the, the main emphasis has to be placed on uh, destroying bin Laden and his allies, ending states, whatever that means, uh, and pursuing a war, a uh, war that is often, uh, at some points, uh, legitimated in the kinds of languages uh, I referred to, or in rhetoric I referred to a, a moment ago. Um, of course, in reality, we know that um, if we want to understand the challenge in terms of uh, uh, bin Laden and his allies, uh, that these two uh, arenas, the broader uh, causes that ha help to explain the support for bin Laden and the ideology and worldview of bin Laden himself and his allies are two related, but in many respects, uh, different kinds of things. And uh, in many ways, uh, the long-term sorts of solutions to the kinds of issues and concerns that uh, uh, have fed and promoted a certain a degree of support for bin Laden, which I think is wider than we often acknowledge in the Arab world. Uh, is the result of the persistence of conflicts such as the Palestinian-Israeli Palestinian -Israeli conflict. That said, the United States has made a determined effort uh, to, in many respects, resolve these sorts of conflicts, and they are not in the offing, nor is there any assurance at all that another determined effort to, for example, get the United States involved in the Palestinian-Israeli conflict will in any respect uh, 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 dissuade bin Laden and his allies from uh, engaging in terrorism. It may, over time, reduce the support for them, but the fact is that bin Laden and his group uh, reject, as a matter of principle, the existence of any Jewish state, however small in the Middle East, and will not compromise on that, among other issues, such as, first and foremost, the withdrawal of American forces, political and military, from Saudi Arabia. So that takes me to the nature of the, uh, the ideology of bin Laden, and here I think that, in many respects, uh, one has to acknowledge that if one looks closely at the kind of ideology that bin Laden uh, propagates. It's kind of a, a religious fascism. It's it's really a, it's 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 hideous in its most elemental forms, and it goes way beyond, far beyond the issue of um, of the Arab-Israeli conflict. And just to give you an example of this, I have here a um, a publication called "Globalization in the Scales of Islam." an extraordinary publication out of Kuwait published by what is supposedly a more liberal Islamic organization in which globalization is described as a, a Jewish Masonic conspiracy and you have all kinds of ridiculous statements which are treated by many of the readers of this sort of material as fact. We have to deal with the uh, a kind of the evolution of kind of a an ideology of hate uh, that uh, does in some sense have a sort of self-generating aspect to it now, although it's obviously related to the, uh, to the question of uh, Palestine and other issues. But we, we would be kidding ourselves if we think that the solution would lie in, 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 in pursuing one issue and not the other. They both have to be pursued. The question is how the, I think it's very easy to see a prolonged war in which we begin to bomb indiscriminately and inflict high casualties among civilian populations as feeding. Uh, the support for this kind of uh, fascistic uh, ideology and therefore creating a backlash which would only feed the notion that we are involved in a civilizational battle. What we have to do in some respects is engage uh, uh, not only governments but uh, Muslim political thinkers and politicians and challenge them to come out in a very uh, decisive way and to uh, to uh, deny and to reject this sort of ideology, uh, which eventually, of course, will mean uh, accepting the principle that the Palestinian-Israeli uh, uh, conflict must be solved along a two-state uh, solution and not the kind of solution that many of our colleagues in the Islamic world will say, well, we reject this sort of ideology, but nevertheless, we also reject the existence of Israel. It's a, it's a very complicated problem, and we, we have to be able to insist that this kind of ideology in its organic nature be rejected in its whole, in every, in every one of its many and hideous uh, aspects. So I think that's going to be a real challenge, and uh, I'm not at all convinced that uh, this administration, I must say, is up to it, particularly given the level of rhetoric. I do understand 
that when one is launching something that is felt as somehow a crusade, uh, one is uh, tempted to use the language to get the flag out, but uh, I'm, I'm not at all convinced that we're really focusing in many respects on the right issues. We want to discredit as much the hate ideology of these groups as we want to discredit the hate ideology of any religious or political group, whether it's in, uh, in Michigan, Oklahoma, uh, Israel, Palestine, or uh, Kuwait or Afghanistan for that matter. So I think that's an important question and it takes us really beyond the simplistic uh, notions of conflict and bombing and, and smoking out uh, our enemies, as was said the other day that we've heard so far. Now let me turn to the uh, question of, um, of Iran. It's a very interesting issue and I think Anatole, in many respects, uh, put his finger on it. There is a, an, ex an understandable uh, hope, perhaps, among policymakers uh, in Washington that uh, we could engage uh, the Iranians in an implicit, at least at the very least, an implicit uh, alliance together with our other allies against uh, the Taliban in Afghanistan. And there is no doubt, uh, there is no doubt in my mind, that there are good reasons to think this way, although I would suggest in the final analysis that if we rush to trying to bring that kind of alliance about, it very well may backfire in, respect, in, in several respects, which I'll talk about in a moment. Uh, the nature of the conflict between uh, Iran and the Taliban uh, is multifaceted. It is in part a, 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 a conflict, as Anatole put it, uh, between uh, a, a Shiite vision of Islam, if you like, and a Sunni vision of Islam, although certainly the uh, ideology of the Taliban also represents a kind of um, ethnic tribalist notion or vision of Islam that adds a certain ethnic uh, aspect to it as well. Uh, the uh, uh, supreme leader of Iran, uh, Ayatollah Ali Khamenei sees himself as not only the supreme leader of uh, all the Shiites of Iran, but all the Twelver Shiites of all the world, including, including the minority Shiites in, uh, in Afghanistan who have been uh, persecuted uh, by the majority Sunnis. Uh, who have been, in some respect, in some cases, massacred, as some of you may know, in September 1998. A, a, a Iran and Afghanistan were on the precipice, it seemed, for a while, of a, an actual war as a result of the uh, Taliban successful capturing of the strongholds of the uh, opposition to the Afghanistan the, uh, regime, uh, to the Taliban regime, the Northern Military Alliance. Uh, nine or ten Iranian uh, diplomats were murdered, were massacred uh, by the Taliban, and what followed this was the massacre of several hundred, and others have reported several thousand uh, Shiite uh, 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 members of the opposition, and in many, in many other cases, simply innocent men and women and children who were not involved actively in the opposition. At that time, uh, Ali Khamenei uh, denounced uh, denounced the Taliban, denounced the kind of is, uh, Islam that they represented, and there was a mass mobilization. There was up to, up to, up to something like 100,000 Iranian troops that were mobilized. But it was clear also at that point that while the Iranians uh, rejected the Taliban, they were not in a, in a position, nor did they desire to pursue a war with Afghanistan. Moreover, uh, what they champion and have championed until recently, as far as I know, is a power-sharing solution which would stabilize that region. Uh, the other threat posed for the Iranians by Afghanistan, and this is something that perhaps has not gotten enough uh, emphasis, is the drug trade. Uh, Iran uh, and Burma, I believe, together account for something like 80 percent of the, the world's trade in opium. Uh, it, the, uh, however uh, contradictory it may seem, uh, given the ban on alcohol, it's clear that the Taliban regime funds its activities in part through the drug trade. Uh, and uh, Iran has had to deal with the smuggling operations along its border with Afghanistan. They have lost something like 3,000 police officers in dealing with that challenge. Um, and so that poses an enormous burden for the Iranians. Uh, and also, of course, uh, there is the issue of 1.2, 1.4, nobody's quite sure, million uh, refugees from Afghanistan, many of whom are uh, Shiites, not, not, but not all of them by any stretch of the imagination. When I was in Gum in Iran some months ago, I met with a number of these refugees who were desperate that the United States do something 
do something, and this was expressed in Gum, the, the religious capital of Iran, uh, that we do something for them. Their situation, they said, was desperate, and the government there feels this strongly. Having said all that, it's also clear that the relationship between Iran and the Taliban has become an issue in the struggle between reformists and conservatives in Iran. Um, the, uh, now, it is also perhaps reassuring to know that not only President Khatami, but also various clerics who represent the conservative faction have denounced uh, the action taken by bin Laden, have denounced the Taliban, and clearly they feel they, are, they must do so, not only for moral reasons, but because this is an opportunity to score points against the Taliban regime. Uh, the more forceful denunciations of these acts have come from the reformists, from the Iran Participation Front, among others, which has uh, held uh, impromptu uh, public uh, rallies of people uh, uh, burning candles in, in Tehran, and this the, the regime has in fact allowed, in effect encouraged. Uh, but it is also clear that the uh, the the perspective and, and attitude towards the Taliban is, is in part reflected in the, power for, uh, the struggle for power in Iran. The reformists have accused the conservatives of the Talibization of Iran, have said that the efforts in the last few months to reintroduce various kinds of so-called Quranic punishments represents a drift towards the Talibization of Iran, uh, represents uh, the, uh, the, the, the going back in history instead of the moving forward, uh, and the conservatives have responded by accusing the reformists of being bogeymen of the West, that sort of thing. So it's very clear that uh, the, the struggle, uh, the political struggle could easily get caught up in, uh, in, uh, in, the, in not only the question of Afghanistan, but the question about how the United States responds to the challenge. And a prolonged war which would result in many civilian casualties in Afghanistan or Pakistan uh, would make it much easier uh, for the conservatives uh, to uh, make their case against the reformists and might make uh, the reformists uh, uh, more isolated than they already are. Uh, so this is an issue that needs to, be, uh, needs to be considered. Moreover, one has to consider the actions of Shiites outside of Iran in the, in the Arab world. And here I must say that even if the Iranians wanted to uh, to, uh, uh, in effect, support the actions against the Taliban by doing nothing, which is one way to support that action. Uh, it is very possible that Hezbollah in Lebanon would uh, intentionally intervene to, to disrupt that approach and to push Iran in the other direction. Two weeks ago, for several days, as some of you know, there was good intelligence to suggest that Hezbollah was about to undertake uh, a shelling of the Galilee in Israel, uh, it, and the United States sent strong signals to both uh, the Lebanese, Hezbollah, and the Syrians, that, and the Iranians as well, that this should not happen. But if there is a kind of evolution of an implicit alliance, one can imagine that Hezbollah will not allow the border uh, to remain, uh, to, to remain uh, quiet anymore. Uh, and I'll just sum up here and say that we all know from past and bitter experience how easily the effort of the United States to intervene in Iranian internal politics can backfire. Um, and how, uh, how in many ways it can produce, uh, which cat from the vantage point of Iranian politics, catal cataclysmic uh, changes uh, which are unpredictable. And if we get involved in this, this particular version of the great game uh, without thinking it through, and if we think that we can easily uh, coax the Iranian, uh, this divided regime into an alliance uh, with the United States and its partners against bin, uh, 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 bin Laden, we will be, I think, severely disappointed. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. Well, I think we're drenched in complexity, um, but maybe that's a metaphor for where we are. Um, we have about a half an hour for your questions and comments. I'd like you, I'm sure there'll be a lot of people who'd like to speak, so please be patient. I'd like you to identify yourself and try to be as pithy as possible. We have a few roving microphones, particularly since uh, we have television cameras here. Please wait until you have a microphone before you speak. Yes, um, in the front here, sir. There's a microphone coming to you. <coughs> I'd like to... Uh, hold on just a sec. There's a handheld yeah. there if you could take I'd, it. I'd like to address this. Let me hold yeah. Identify yourself, please. Uh, George Wilson from the National Journal Magazine. This one is primarily aimed at uh, Ms. Olcott. I'd like to make you president tomorrow morning and then have you tell us how you would get from here to there, given the American character. For instance, if you could sell a Marshall Plan, which, as I tune you in, is what you're talking about, uh, how would you ever make it work? I mean, uh, you don't have a unified uh, set of recipients. You've got all kinds of corruption. 
Uh, we don't have 300,000 troops like we did uh, after World War II to kind of uh, be a presence there. Uh, secondly, how would you define, if you, again, if you're a president, what victory is? I mean, the American people couldn't stay with it in Vietnam because they couldn't explain what the end game was. Uh, and looking at Haiti, uh, yes, we went in there and knocked off the bad guys, but uh, the president wasn't uh, uh, at all confident that he would occupy Haiti. Nobody wanted to occupy Haiti, so now they're back to where they were. So how do you... How do you get from here to there you, under your formula, given the American character? Let's start with the focus on the assistance a little bit, and then that bigger one, I think, will be throughout all the questions. Okay. That, yeah, um, I accept that it would be difficult to sell a Marshall Plan, but I think that any effort to um, engage militarily in Afghanistan, if, if there is no commitment to have an international commitment to fund rebuilding Afghanistan, is simply going to be a very short-term fix to the problem. Um, I worry, unlike Haiti, Afghanistan's not an island, and the instability in Afghanistan has ramifications for all the bordering, for the, all the neighboring states. So if I were president, I'd be talking about Marshall Plans for Afghanistan and not about some of the other costly defense things that we're talking about. If I had to choose between um, missile defense and a, a realistic program for engagement in South Asia, it would be my preference to have a realistic program for engagement in South Asia. But I'm not a politician, and I didn't have to bring this to the American population. I think it's a hard sell, but it has to be tried if it's really our goal to affect um, security risks that come out of this part of the world, and I think it should be. Anatole, on this point, yeah. just very briefly, I think one should recognise that national characters are not immutable. I think one may see very important changes in, in many key American attitudes as a result of America having been attacked, because after all, one reason why in the end uh, morale, including in the American army, uh, was not strong in Vietnam was that a great many ordinary soldiers couldn't see how North Vietnam had ever attacked them. Well, we now have been attacked. I mean, America has been attacked. And I think, you know, one may see more of a commitment or more of a capacity for long-term commitment than we have in some of these other places, which frankly were regarded by ordinary Americans and Brits as not very relevant to their lives. Let's keep moving. Yes, over here, there. Uh, <coughs> Wayne Mary of the American Foreign Policy Council. Anatole Levin commented quite briefly that he thought that the assassination of Ahmed Shah Massoud and the attacks in this country uh, so close together were not a coincidence. I think that's probably true, but it has rather large implications if it is, which I would like you to expand on. For example, does this mean, for example, that the Taliban is sort of contracting this kind of work to bin Laden? I admit the attack on Massoud does bear a lot of the characteristics of uh, a bin Laden operation, its sophistication, willingness to commit suicide, so forth. Uh, does the, is perhaps bin Laden, uh, was he attacking Massoud because Massoud has been the recipient of American assistance as part of our sort of proxy a campaign in with, the, with the Northern Alliance? Does this imply that the Northern Alliance might now become essentially a, a proxy for the United States in its campaign against bin Laden. It's, it just seems to me that if they are in fact connected operations, it implies a connection among the people who organized and sponsored them and that that is quite important. Could you expand on that please? Surely. Actually, I'm not convinced that that is necessarily true because anyone who was planning the, the attacks on America, I mean, on the assumption it was a Osama in, in Afghanistan, these are not stupid people, would be aware that America would retaliate against the Taliban. Now, who has been by far the best known but also the most efficient military leader in the anti-Taliban alliance? Well, it's Massoud. Um, frankly, the, the Taliban have wiped the floor sooner or later with everybody else. He went on fighting. He still had the only really coherent base area within Afghanistan. So... So... 
So I, I wouldn't I, I wouldn't say that it had necess, you know, necessarily to be the, the Taliban doing this. Bin Laden himself would have predicted that America would try to forge an alliance with, with it, the Taliban's opponents and therefore had a motive to strike preemptively against that. We have a question here on the side. <clears throat> this gentleman here. Thank you. Uh, Claudius Fischbach from the German Embassy. My question is for Mrs. Alcott and Mr. Lieven. Um, I believe there are three main Afghan exile groups of some political significance. Uh, one actually situated in Rome with the king sort of as the center of it, the former king of Afghanistan. Then there is one in Cyprus uh, with rather close links to Iran. And in fact, uh, there is a third one uh, headquartered in, in uh, Germany, in Bonn and Frankfurt. Um, if we um, uh, have a look at a post-Taliban situation in Afghanistan, just for, for a moment, my question would be, what role could we foresee for those groups? Which role might they play? Could they play? Should they play? Uh, either all of them or one or two of them. Thank you. Do you want me to? Okay. Yeah, okay. I, I think that any, in a post Taliban Afghanistan, we have to try, work to try to construct as broad a coalition as possible. I think that exile groups have to be invited back, and I think that the king has the greatest claim to any sort of legitimacy to speak in terms of an Afghan nation if he, um, if he really invited in a broad umbrella of of um, ethnic communities from within Afghanistan. I'm not trying to minimize the, pro the problem of creating a broad coalition in Afghanistan. Part of the reason that Taliban, or in fact the largest reason why Taliban was able to take power was that power sharing um, in the period 92 to 96 was a dismal disaster in Afghanistan. But the formula of the king in particular hasn't been tried as uh, in a while, and he does have the capacity to call for a national assembly, but it's it's really going to be very difficult, and I'm not pretending otherwise. Yes, I mean I, I just echo that. Um, I mean people in Afghanistan now, well, many of them look back to the the royal period as a kind of lost paradise, so there is something to build on. On the other hand, I mean, when I was a journalist in Peshawar in the late 80s, uh, we had a rather cruel phrase for the, the seven Mujahideen parties and their leaders there. We called them the seven dwarves. I want to thank uh, Mr. Fischbach for his question and encourage others of you in the diplomatic community to speak out and put aside your normal diplomatic demurals. Uh, we'd like to hear from you, actually. It's particularly interesting to us, so I just want to encourage you. We have two questions. I'm going to take two questions here, and, uh, Andrew Cutchins and Marina Ottaway. Then I'll, please be patient. I'll get around to as many people as I can. Thanks. Uh, Andy Cutchins, turning me down. I share the concern expressed by uh, Daniel Brumberg and I think the other panelists about the nature of the, uh, the rhetoric coming out of the Bush administration, which may in fact be uh, pushing us into a, a corner by way, of which, in a, by way of response, which would require as a significant portion of that response some kind of conventional military operation uh, in Afghanistan. Um, and this to me would seem to be playing right into the hand of, uh, of bin Laden, again, assuming that he is the, uh, the organizer of this event because of the, uh, A, the difficulties expressed by the panel in the conventional battle in, in Afghanistan, the uh, possible inflaming of the Islamic world, and particularly in Pakistan next door. Um, the, the Taliban uh, so far, is, as far as I know, uh, has stated that they will not cooperate in handing over uh, bin Laden and his network at this, and people involved in his network at this time, and that they've threatened other governments uh, that would do so. Um, do the panelists think that uh, this is uh, an absolutely immutable position on the part of the Taliban, and that we have virtually no leverage with them in this matter, or is there some kind of hope that uh, uh, for cooperation to some degree? Okay, it's one question. I'd like to take Marina Ottaway's question, and we'll respond to both. She's right here on the side. Yeah. Yes, we are. Uh, I think it's very useful to have this discussion, since the, uh, certainly the United States at this point seems to be focusing on action against the Taliban and against bin Laden. But it seems to me that there is another question that we need, uh, we should put on the table, and it is, 
even if we were to succeed in taking out bin Laden, even if we were to succeed in engaging this process of replacing the Taliban with, you know, not leaving a vacuum there, but putting in place a, a regime that works, as Martha was talking about, how much difference would that really make to the security of the United States, which is the basic issue? Because what we are dealing with I mean, what we see from just by looking at the names of people in the newspapers and so on, what we are dealing with is international networks. And it seems to me that right now, it may be, if the indications are correct, that the center of this network has been in Afghanistan. But that does not mean that those uh, networks are going to disappear just because these particular centers are going to be taken out. Yeah, those two questions have some relationship. So uh, whoever would like to... Um Perhaps Anatole, why don't you start, and then Dan, and then Martha. I mean, from the Taliban, you know, has in the past uh, at least twice offered to hand bin Laden over to some form of international Islamic tribunal. From what I gather, the, the second offer was rather concrete. Um, they actually uh, said that one could have a tribunal made up of a representative of themselves, of Saudi Arabia, which is... A, a state which in the past has strongly supported Taliban, um, less so more recently, but very strongly in the mid-90s, and uh, of a third Muslim state chosen by the United States. Now, the last offer of this kind by now is some months ago. Uh, I don't know, once again, given now the position that the Bush administration has taken up, but also, of course, let's be fair, the nature of the attack on America, uh, whether any such offer from the Taliban would be acceptable, or indeed whether the Taliban would make it. But ju just there could be, s just conceivably, some kind of window there. It certainly doesn't look very likely, given the nature of this um, regime, that they would simply hand bin Laden over to directly to America. And, of course, you know, the, the, the Afghans, uh, I mean, they didn't... It must be remembered, they didn't beat the British or the Soviets nearly as badly as they think they did. You know, the Soviets essentially withdrew from their own, for their own reasons. The British lost one army very catastrophically, but they came back the next year. And, um, but of course, in the Afghan mythology, they've seen off every enemy who has ever invaded them, and I'm sure they reckon they'll do the same uh, to an American invasion. Hear from uh, Daniel on these points. Yeah. Well, I, I think that I would echo what Anatole said. I, I think that if the uh, Taliban had a choice between um, handing over uh, Bin Laden and trying to bring down the government of Pakistan, it might prefer this uh, second option. I, I, it's very hard to uh, imagine that they would agree to such a thing. And, and the proposal to send Bin Laden to an Islamic court, they would probably assume, would be rejected. Uh, I, I think we need to cons consider the fact that when this attack was undertaken last week, the assumption of the attackers was that it would ignite a war with the West. Uh, and this may have been ultimately the, the objective, uh, a prolonged war, which puts the United States in a, in a series of binds, many of which we've described today, and none of which have any easy solutions over the, the long term. Um, you are uh, quite right in the sense that if we remove uh, the, the problem in Afghanistan, it can go elsewhere. And this is something I was alluded to, alluding to before. Many of our allies in the Arab world have allowed and, and encouraged a kind of hate ideology which far transcends the Arab-Israeli conflict, which sees globalization as an intrinsic evil, which sees American culture as an intrinsic evil. And they have promoted this for strategic and tactical reasons, that's clear. The Egyptians have done this occasionally as well. Uh, uh, Arafat has done this before many times. Uh, that we have to insist, that that sort of thing end. We have to <laughs> make it very clear that uh, the kind of atmosphere which allows for and feeds uh, uh, this sort of sustained hate ideology has to end. I mean, because there are many ways that, that that can be done. It's simply putting pressure on our allies, many of whom control uh, our, our, our Arab allies, many of whom control the press. In effect, to end this kind of hate ideology would be one thing. There are many th other things that could be done. But we're we're, we're facing a, a, a prolonged period that could easily drift precisely into the kind of conflict that I think the bomb the the bombers the, the hijackers in New York and Washington were trying to set off. On that school, though, I have to say that a part of any such pressure has to be a different U.S. policy towards Israeli actions, because it may be that there is this atmosphere of hate. I mean, there is opposition to globalization 
and often very radical in parts of the West, the focus of this in the Middle East and in the Muslim world more generally uh, has been made Israel and America's backing for Israel. Yeah, and let me just echo that very quickly and say that I agree with Anatole. And here one has to consider the fact that one of the, one, I'll quickly state this and then, and then, and then and shut up. One of the, we have to consider one of the interesting outcomes of this effort to build another Arab coalition, I think, will be a, a re-engagement from the, the Bush II in the, in, the, in the effort to bring about a solution to the Palestinian-Israeli conflict as it was after the invasion, after the, uh, after the Gulf conflict. A realization that this administration cannot stand apart, that has to be engaged and has to be involved in trying to bring these parties together. Um, I hope you're right. I'd like to go back to the, the more narrow question that Andy raised, which is about the question of whether Taliban will give up bin Laden. And I think that the best hope that the U.S. has um, to get him given up is through Pakistan, mm. uh, but I don't know that it's a good shot. But I think that the U.S. hasn't asked the question of whether we're willing to recognize ta the Taliban government. I mean, part of what's going on is that we're saying that we're not going to, we're implicitly saying we're not going to recognize the Taliban government, which controls 95 percent of Afghanistan. At the same time, we want you to give up this odious figure. Um, so I, th I think it's, it's a very hard act of persuasion to get this out of anybody. Um, and, and that's part of the dilemma we face. Uh, and I'm not urging we recognize the Taliban, but I'm saying that's what they'd like. Um, and we face the problem that now they control 95 percent, and with Ahmed Shah Massoud's death, they're likely to control 97 or 98 percent very soon. So we, we can't avoid this question of Afghanistan any longer. And that takes me back to Marina's question. I agree. You know, I think the question of U.S. security um, has to be separated from the question of South Asia as a source of insecurity for the U.S. and for its neighbors. I'm going to take two more questions, the gentleman here and then uh, Jennifer Windsor, and then um, try I'm to get Lincoln, you in. Uh, Washington Independent Writers. Um, in looking at uh, terrorist interpretation of Islam as a kind of uh, religious uh, fascism, how far can belief systems be attacked uh, regarding uh, jihad or holy war and the assumption that uh, suicide leads to instant paradise and beautiful women? And I'm wondering if anything can be learned from the way Japanese beliefs were attacked at, uh, in, during World War II with uh, the emperor having to renounce his deity. Do you think anything can be done along th those lines with, with Islam? Take another quote from Jennifer Windsor. She's right there, right next to the camera. Hi, Jennifer Windsor. Can you hear me? Jennifer Windsor from Freedom House. Two states that have not been mentioned, uh, Iraq and Libya. I think the focus on Osama bin Laden is appropriate, but there's also possibilities of two other states that could be sponsoring this, and there's really been no discussion. I'd like to hear some comment on possible involvement of these two countries and what's been going on. I'd like to add one more question to this mix. I think we have a question all the way in the back. If you could run back and get uh, Michael. Thanks. Um, Michael and Paul, the uh, Carney and Dama, a quick comment. Uh, Anatole warned us about uh, treating Islam as a monolithic place and beliefs, and yet part of our conversation by the end of it was treating it precisely that way. I would just encourage us to remember that there are people within the PLO who for some it's a, it's a territorial dispute, for the others it's a messianic war against civilization. Uh, likewise, I think that we need that kind of nuance. It reminds me of the conflation to come back to the Cold War, Anatole, that we had about national liberation movements and communism during the Cold War. We learned uh, rather tragically that sometimes those things can be different. Uh, just 12 years ago, the State Department listed Nelson Mandela as a communist terrorist. Uh, to remind us all. But that's not my question. My question is about the Taliban. I'm wondering if you could tell us more about them. Uh, are they united? We talk about the Taliban. Are they truly the Taliban? Are there splits? And what is their relationship with uh, the society? Is it coercion, consent? Just much more. I, I'm, I'm thirsting for more information about the Taliban and how they rule in Afghanistan. Thank you. Um, Anatole, why don't you start and then uh, Dan, you might want to say something about Iraq and Libya, and then Martha, anything that occurs to you? I mean, the, ta the Taliban's support in society, I mean, it's difficult to say. I mean, I, I haven't, I'm, I must say that I haven't been to, ta to, to Afghanistan under Taliban. 
uh, rules, so I'm, I'm working at second hand here. Then again, not that many people have. I mean, it seems that it's partly just sheer exhaustion. You know, one, one, the, the key to the Taliban taking over, after all, was, as I've said, that you know, everything previously had failed and, and finally failed absolutely catastrophically. The, you know, the, the, the Mujahideen uh, parties, the, the various Afghan warlords had created an absolute nightmare in Afghanistan uh, when the Taliban began their march, first through Kandahar, then uh, to Herat and, and Kabul. And so a great many people, you know, who suffered so terribly during those years are, it seems, prepared to say, well, you know, this is better than the chaos that, that went before. Um, then, of course, you know, this, this is what I meant about certain analogies to a crusading order. And, I mean, I, I used crusading deliberately to remind us that there have been such things in the West as well in the past. You know, the, these, this, this movement is a product of the war against the Soviet Union and of the Afghan refugee camps. I mean, it was bred in the Islamic schools, in the, the, the refugee camps, which was, uh, were, of course, very pathological societies, these, these wretched people, you know, herded together in circumstances which, you know, particularly uh, uh, exacerbated certain, uh, well, very pathological attitudes towards women and, and women and modernity in particular. Uh, I fear that a, a, a good deal of the, the hostility, the, the deep hostility to the Taliban that one reads about, may be, well, it's a product of two things, um, or three things. Briefly, uh, Briefly, yes, I beg your pardon. Well, one is uh, Kabul. I mean, Ka Kabul, more cosmopolitan, more modern, has suffered terribly under the, the Taliban, but Kabul isn't the whole of Afghanistan. Secondly, of course, it's the ethnic and religious minorities, and whoever said, that, uh, Daniel, that the Taliban are a Pashtun as well as a... A, a, a radical religious movement is, of course, quite right. So the religious minorities, many of and national, are, are very resentful. And then there's, to some extent, which is where the monarchist feeling is still concentrated, the old Sufi traditions in, in Afghanistan, though it's not at all clear to me how strong they are. Unfortunately, these areas of opposition to the Taliban are, you know, very internally divided, very diffuse, as is shown by the fact that they've all been defeated. Dan, a few comments. I, in some respects, I think the, 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 what we see in the media is an obsession about this issue of martyrdom and Islam and, and so on, and that may be uh, somewhat mistaken. I mean, first of all, the, 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 the notion of uh, using uh, martyrdom as, as, a, as a tactical, if not strategic, weapon was first developed, uh, if we're talking about recent times, during the Iran-Iraq War, very much by Ayatollah Khomeini, who spoke about this issue uh, for a long time and used it very effectively. I think the, the movements that we're dealing with use and manipulate this sort of notion effectively to get get recruits but what has to be said they represent an extreme as we know an extreme minority and it's precisely because they represent a minority that they're able to act so effectively it's precisely because they're small and represent a minority as far as uh, uh, Libya uh, and uh, Iraq is concerned I think Libya as far as I can tell and there are certainly better people on the question of Libya than I uh, is out of this game in terms of uh, pr promoting and supporting uh, terrorism Iraq is, a, is an interesting question there have been a lot of discussions recently it's, it's quite possible. I find it difficult to imagine that this attack was not undertaken without the effective cooperation of security agents linked to one state or another. And it may be that down the way, two, three, or four years from now, we discover that, uh, that the Iraqi agents were and somehow involved. But I don't think we're going to discover that very easily or very quickly. And in the meantime, uh, 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 silly notions about bombing Baghdad and so on, I think, have to be, have to be carefully thought about and, and, and quickly rejected. Do you want to add anything, Mark, on these Very points? quickly, just on the question of um, martyrdom and support for the Islamic groups. I, I think it's really important for us to recognize that there is, within many Islamic nations, a struggle for the definition of Islam and the nature of Islam that these states will adhere to. And so the people that support um, these terrorist groups may be a tiny minority of extremists, but they do draw on a broader support from a minority community. Um, and the debate is one that has certainly been going on my whole life. I mean, you know, there is a real sense of religious continuity in the places I travel to, um, including people who have used martyrdom. Um, they 
they were willing to martyr themselves at the time of the Basmachi movement and times of the civil war against the Bolsheviks. I mean, this really is, I think, a much more continuous theme. It's had, it's, it's been raised to the level of political rhetoric much more emphatically in recent years. Um, We're going to stop in about five minutes. I'm going to take a couple more questions. Uh, gentleman's been patient here, and then, uh, is that a question? Yeah. Okay. So first here in the front, and then over here. Keep your questions brief, please. <clears throat> Uh, Dick Clark, uh, Aspen Institute. Uh, much of what you focused on is what not to do. If you act precipitously, all these things are going to happen. They all sound very uh, well taken. The question I have is, what do you, and I have is, what do you think we can do in the shorter run? See, I don't think in a democratic government with the president and the Congress that they can simply say to the American people, here is a plan that's going to take 30 or 40 years, if we're lucky, with a lot of social and economic help, uh, and uh, maintain the, the confidence of the American people. So something has to be done in the short run that is intelligent and that doesn't cause great problems. What is that? <laughs> we're having a series of meetings, fortunately. <laughs> uh, let's stop on that question. That's too important to, to go on beyond it. Let's stop at that question. and. Uh, Anatole, why don't you start with something? No answer has to be comprehensive here, but at least give us some indication of your thinking. Well, first of all, I mean, greatly increased pressure on the Taliban. Uh, we've already started that, of course, via, via Pakistan, doing one's best to close the borders, although that border will never be properly closed. Iran, of course, cooperating, Russia, um, in the hope that, you know, uh, maybe there will be a deal. And I, I would you know, certainly hope that there might still be a chance to, you know, get out of a kind of impasse in relations with the Taliban. Um, I, you know, w w would favour a considerable period of pressure before actual military action. That said, of course, I take completely your, your, your point. But I think one also must make the point that, after all, you know, what is moral courage and, and leadership? It can be, you know, precisely telling the mass of your own people what they don't want to hear, which is precisely that, you know, precipitate action uh, could, could have, you know, completely counterproductive results. And after all, in the American memory, if one thinks back to the attempt to rescue the Iranian hostages, but other incidents as well, you know, people can be reminded that to, to go off on a military intervention you know at half cock without proper preparation you know is can, can risk defeat you know you do, I mean there's this I, I sort of feel there's a certain feeling now around that once you declare war victory is inevitable well of course it isn't not at least you know in, in, in the short term but that said I mean if I, I do think that if we have genuine you know, pretty near certainty that we know where Osama is, and if we can get the use of a base, presumably in Pakistan or elsewhere. But, I mean, if, if we're really convinced that the intelligence is good, then, by all means, I mean, launch a, a very hard strike to go in and try and kill him or capture him. Martha? Um, to answer really quickly, I, I think we have to con do things that will make Americans feel more secure at home. I mean, there have been people talked about just changing doors on cockpits that make planes untouchable. I think that that is, it's really important to increase the level of secure, to increase the perception that we can at least do a better job of protecting ourselves at home. I, I agree with much of what Anatole said, and I think we should ask if, if we prepared to make a military strike if we get good intelligence and think we can get a we can succeed i think we should try to enlist as many neighboring states as possible especially russia as well as pakistan and i think we should listen to their reasons for their refusal if they refuse it is very hard to be brave and say to a population to the american people that maybe we said it was too simple but i think that that part of um uh, of real leadership is admitting that you learned about something and realized your capacity just does not deal with this situation. Um, Dan, final comment? I, I would say that uh, I would agree with everything I've heard so far, and I would also say that I think that uh, we have to be prepared for the possibility of using ground troops. Um, and this is something that, this is a question that the administration has been dodging, uh, understandably. 
and uh, whether, in fact, the American public, and this is to echo Anatole, is willing to consider, conceive of and consider the actual cost, the human cost of, of doing that, of engaging on the ground, is an interesting question. But in doing so, I think we would be doing so with our allies. And in the context of a, of a, of a very robust alliance that politically and militarily isolates our, um, our adversary, uh, I'm in no sense a pacifist on this matter, but uh, it, it does take courage to to speak clearly about the possibility of what, what this will entail and the kinds of uh, mobilization that w it will involve. We've gone deeply today into these issues, but I think a lot of us know that in some sense we've still only scratched the surface of what is a very sobering situation and a sobering reality. But the stakes are so high that we can't turn away from it. I want to thank you for joining us today as the Carnegie Endowment won't turn away from this and we'll go deeper into this and we know you will too and we hope you'll join us in further events. Please thank uh, our three panelists, Martha Olcott, Anatole Levin, Daniel Brumberg.